welcome John and Sarah and Kathleen and Hazel and Cy and Graham. I, I worked really hard on getting those names down this afternoon. Friends and family, community members who loved and appreciated and lived so much life with Judy. We're gathered here in both joy and sorrow to remember Judy's life, to celebrate her friendship and love for all of us in our community and our church, and also to remember her faith. It's not an accident that we're gathered in this place, in a sanctuary, in a church, one that meant a lot to her and to Bill and to their family over the years. And so we gather today to celebrate and remember, but we also do it uh, in a way that is a little different, just a lot like Judy's life. She was a wonderful person and she always lived life just a bit differently than most people, with more joy sometimes, with more grace, with more love, I noticed, than many days I was able to give. So with that, we are gathered in faith. And so as we begin this service, we begin here. This is a candle of baptism. The lighter is not a lighter of baptism, which is why it's not cooperating. There we go. Many of you who were baptized, there may have been a candle like this present at your baptism. At our church here at Community Church of Douglas, this is our baptismal font. And we gather to celebrate and to grieve, but not as those who don't have hope. Because Judy was baptized in faith into Christ, which means her passing and her death is not the end of the story, but in Christ and through God's powerful love, she had the hope and lived the hope of God's powerful love in the resurrection. So if you would, would you join me in prayer, however you're accustomed to, according to your own faith tradition? But would you join me in prayer this, more, uh, this afternoon as we begin? God of grace and mercy, even Jesus, who loved Judy faithfully her whole life and is now rejoicing as she's been gathered to you, Lord, and to Bill in heaven. We gather here in your grace in your love and in your hope. As we remember and celebrate Judy's life, we also ask, Lord, that you would help us find space to grieve, to mourn, to be sad, but also to find glimpses of resurrection, moments of hope, to share joy and grace with one another. In order to do that, Lord, we rely on your Holy Spirit, on your presence here among us, giving us the grace and joy of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like, you can join us in the hymn, which is in your bulletin, His Eyes on the Sparrow.
seated. Our meditation from scripture this afternoon comes from a psalm, Psalm 116. Now psalms are poems and often they were set to music in Israel, in ancient uh, Israel, and they were sometimes sung, sometimes they were prayed. And this one happens to be a prayer that uh, was prayed either by Solomon or by his father David. Hear these words of comfort and hope from Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on the Lord as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. And then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. And when I was brought low, he saved me. So return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk with the Lord in the land of the living. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice my offering of thanksgiving to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. I did not know Judy that long, just about a year. But as I came to know her, and as many of you know, Judy never missed a chance to cultivate community through a celebration or a party. And that same spirit has drawn us all together again to remember her life and to celebrate her faith. Today we gather to remember, to celebrate, and to grieve the loss of your mother and your mother-in-law and your grandmother. We have some cousins and some family too online. Our neighbor and our friend and our sister in Christ. And there will be time for us to remember her life and her friendship uh, in the moments ahead. But for now, as I mentioned, we gathered here in this sanctuary, in this house of faith, because her faith was the source of Judy's life. Now, like many of us today, there was a community of faith in a town called Thessalonica in the first few centuries, probably before 100 B.C. And that town is in what is generally considered today modern Greece. There was a community, a small community of Christians, new Christians, and they were wrestling with questions of life and death and faith. And the Apostle Paul, who wrote many of the letters in the New Testament, he wrote to them to help them understand something about the link 
between their faith and their experience of God's love in Jesus and life and death. And this is what he wrote. He said, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to those who believe who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Because we trust in Jesus who died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will reunite those who believe with him. It's just an excerpt from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And so for those of us who, like Judy, put our faith in Jesus, we don't despair when loved ones die, though we are sad and grieve and mourn because death was not an original part of how God designed life and creation. Grieving, as m many of us well know, is part of the process of realizing the pain of death. But there is something, because of God, because of resurrection, God's loving power, able to overcome death and bring things to life again, there's something about that that allows us, even in the face of loss and grief and death, to rejoice and to find hope. God's mercy and God's power, his love has defeated the brokenness and power of death through the resurrection. But there's a problem, and it, maybe it's more of a challenge really. While all of these words to someone who's a Christian or a person of faith might sound good, they might sound like things you hear in a Bible, they might sound very good theologically, things like resurrection and God's love and hope and life and death, that may intellectually make sense to some of us. But the challenge is, is what does the resurrection, the hope that Christians profess, mean in everyday life. And that's where the treasure and the gift of someone like our beloved sister and friend and mother and mother-in-law Judy comes along. Her life was filled with glimpses of resurrection. Just like the psalm that we read at the beginning. Even in these days of social conflict and electoral anxiety and global pandemics, Judy has left us a legacy of God's powerful resurrection love in the details of her everyday life. She seemed to be able to find and celebrate resurrection glimpses all around her just as a matter of course, just as a part of who she was. She saw creativity where others saw chaos. She saw kindness and cultivated where we might expect conflict. Love where we might have anticipated fear. And hope where the circumstances signaled despair and finally the resilience of life even in the face of death. Many of us have stories, very practical ways in which we experience those things because of Judy. A kind word, investing in someone's creativity, generously along with Bill, cultivating community through service and generosity in so many other ways. By looking past conflict and finding resolution. I wonder what stories you have of Judy that were glimpses possibly of a resurrection. There are practical ways in which the resurrection confounds what we think might happen in life and we find surprising things. I don't know if you noticed but the seasons are changing. A few of you mentioned that it was time to go south as I greeted you today. 
we go through a cycle of life and birth and death and resurrection in our seasons every year. Even as we anticipate winter, even as we see some of the trees beginning to shed their leaves, in their beauty, they help us to anticipate resurrection. And in winter, as things lay dormant, we don't go through winter never anticipating a spring again. But we know that under the snow and despite the cold, that life not only continues, but we expect to see it emerge again. I can't think of a more beautiful metaphor that described at least my experience of who Judy was. She was like a spring crocus. So beautiful and simple. Not ostentatious, but amazingly creative and beautiful in all of her ways. And it stood out. If you can think of a crocus poking through the snow, she stood out in that way. And she invited all of us to exercise hope and resurrection. Friends, it wasn't just because she was a wonderful person. It was because she found that same hope in Jesus. She preached and she shared her faith by serving us in simple ways and cultivating for all of us and inviting us to celebrate glimpses of resurrection. There was a priest and a poet in the 18th century, 19th century, excuse me, called Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he put it this way, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes that are not his own, to the glory of God the Father through the features of others' faces. All that is to say, Judy know, knew how to recognize the presence of God's love in the faces of those that she loved. And because of that, we recognized the grace of God and the presence of Jesus in her life. So in addition to building and serving our community with incredible generosity, cultivating creativity, and sharing gracious hospitality, which were among her most obvious hallmarks, I wonder if today, gathered here in this place because of the love of Jesus, which she knew, I wonder if we might also consider how we can discover that we too can share glimpses of resurrection with those that we love and come into contact with. So that when we remember Judy, it will serve as a reminder to look for God's powerful love at work in the world, even when our hearts least expect it. And that's why the psalmist says something that maybe you as family and brothers and sisters in Christ might say about Judy. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother, just as our mother in faith, Judy, did. And you have freed me from my chains. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder of what practically it looks like for someone to live out the truth of God's love on a daily basis. Thank you for the way that Judy loved us. And now, Lord, as we look to you to comfort us in our grief, we also ask that you would help us to carry on her legacy of loving others, relying on the hope of resurrection, which is your love at work defeating death in our lives. We cannot do it on our own. And so we look to you and rely on you now, Lord, to fill us even as you filled Judy with your resurrection hope. 
in and through Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now we're going to have a few remembrances of Judy's life. First, her son John is going to uh, share with us. And then uh, Reverend Dan Miller, who was the pastor here uh, before me and good friends of Judy and Bill's, uh, wrote a letter. He couldn't be here today. And Judy's daughter, Sarah, is going to read for us that letter. So, John, would you like to come up and share with us? Sarah was betting and wondering which one of us would go longer, me or John. So you'll, you'll have to be the final judge. Come on up, John. I wasn't timing it. <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me? Yes. So I want to thank everyone for coming under unusual circumstances. I mean, what a weird crowd to look out at <laughs> with the mask. So thanks for making the effort. Um, I'm going to go off script just briefly here. You know, um, I knew Dan, you know, I'd, I'd see him over the last 20-some years when I'd come and visit, and a great guy. And this guy, <laughs> from just hearing that and interacting with him coming up to this, is a worthy successor. So I want to say thanks a lot for all you did. You made it really easy, and you had a lot of grace in helping us out, so thanks. Um, some of you might know this, but I greet you at a time when death is pretty prominent in the minds of my family. Uh, we lost my wife Kathleen's dad, <laughs> Graham. I don't think I should look at you. That might make me cry. Uh, about a week ago, a uh, week and a half ago, and we just celebrated and sent him off this past Tuesday. So we drove down from northern Minnesota to Chicago, and we did that, and then... Uh, here we are. You know, it is the natural order that these octogenarians uh, precede us into death, and it's our honor to eulogize them. Uh, the timing's not great, but majestic and mysterious death could care less about our schedule. No matter our plans, death asks of us, asks of us insists that we pause and we reflect. So I'm gonna start with an Im image of Judy from just a few years ago. It's Judy ziplining in a Costa Rican jungle while on vacation with us. A lot of you know Judy with the fashion forward hats, jackets, just right jewelry, perhaps that turquoise necklace, and her wonderful shades of blue clothing. I better get these on. <laughs> but there is also ziplining Judy. We were impressed and our guides were amazed and nervous and Grammy was just being Judy, game, and showing her grandchildren how to live. I've been casting my mind back to moments such as these to help balance the memory of, memories of her last days. She was greatly diminished, the metastasized cancer finally getting the upper hand. I report to you that Judy had a good death. She was able to stay in her home, Sarah and I caring for her with the assistance of hospice and so grateful for hospice. Those people are angels. She had about 12 days in a hospital bed at home. Before that, she was still up and about. Frail, but living independently, and that's how she wanted it. My daughter Hazel put it concisely the other night at the dinner table. Grammy was a self-sufficient person. Why were we in Costa Rica? Each of the past 10 or so years, Judy funded a spring break trip, which we would plan. Her only criteria was that we would introduce the kids to travel in foreign places. Yucatan, Baja, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica. We hiked, went to Mayan ruins in the blazing heat, explored deserts, ate all kinds of food, swam in cenotes. But the real experience, and this is what she was after, was simply being in a different culture hearing different languages, learning new ways of doing stuff and thinking. Mom, we plan to keep it up. On these trips, there was no quitting her. She was getting frail as the years went on, but she wanted to keep experiencing. She nurtured curiosity all of her life, was open and not afraid. I don't think she liked what the implication of slowing down meant. Besides, her mother, Irene, lived 101. So I think Judy felt she had some years to go. I'll interject here a moment of thanks to some of you locals. That part about no quitting, Judy, 
It kept her on the road a little longer than I think any of us wanted. So thanks for keeping an eye out. <laughs> no quitner. In her final days, when it was extremely evident life was coming to an end, a good friend said, Judy, when you get to heaven, say hi to Bill. She came to it that and said politely with a smile, okay, but I'm not planning to go into heaven anytime soon. She had a similar response when a hospice pastor asked, Judy, do you sense you are in life's final chapter? And she replied, no, not really. She was a positive person. <laughs> And it was not her way to dwell on the negative or the past. Forward was her mode. She learned about being positive from her mother, Irene, who rarely complained. Being raised by Judy, we seldom heard a contrary word about others. Gossiping was not her style. She had a way of seeing the best in people and bringing it out. Some of you may remember John Peterson. He was eccentric and not an easy person, but she knew his art was unique. She knew the good in him and helped him along his way, including facilita facilitating the showing and sale of John's art here at this church. One of the coolest things our mom did that really made an impact on us is she trained to become an interior designer in her mid-40s. It was night school after Bill returned from work. She stuck to it, put her shingle out, and her business thrived. She took what was an innate sense of style and interest in design and she turned them into a job that she enjoyed immensely. I admired that as a kid, and I'm inspired by it now. Watching her work highlighted one of her strengths. She was very decisive. Clients can be wishy-washy un and unsure. Judy helped them find just the right piece of furniture, paint, color, or blind, and move on. And, you know, decisiveness. About a year and a half ago, I watched her slay a Me Mexican jewelry salesman in Acomo. She was shopping for a gift for Sarah. This guy, had, he thought he had an easy mark in an older, frail woman, and I just stood by the side. And he was trying to upsell, working all the angles, but she just kept cutting him off. And in the end, she got her price and just what she wanted. There was an early test where others often wallow in indecision. Judy was engaged to another guy. One day, she met a tall, dark-haired William Henry Oberholzer. She knew a good thing when she saw it and knew what to do. She broke the engagement and she never looked back. A lot of you know about Judy's hospitality. She was a gifted entertainer, generous in food, wine, and spirits. Judy's homes were always decked out, the perfect setting for hostessing. Numerous board meetings, envelope stuffings, book clubs, holidays were hosted over the years. And that was the public side of Judy. Judy at home or traveling was a pleasure to be around, just to hang out with her. Breath mints. There were always breath mints. Any car ride with Grammy, our family was offered a mint. In fact, just as I was leaving, I found these just in her house somewhere. <laughs> they were always around. She enjoyed taking us out. She liked to share a bite, of t a bite or two of what she was having, and she was interested in a little taste of what was on our plates. My father never got used to this. Judy, I'm into my own flavors, he would say. <laughs> Luckily, Mom had Sarah and my gang. We were willing participants. There was no better greeter, place of refuge, after a long drive from northern Minnesota than Judy and her home. We'll miss that. <laughs> Judy had a way of celebrating the ordinary. Most every meal the table was set. She was tablescaping way before the term developed. Cute little napkin rings, candles, more fancy affairs brought out artful name tags and flowers or seasonal or ornaments at the center of the table. Growing up like that left me with a sense that each meal mattered. A time to gather and talk, dine and be together. My kids know about that. I'm always trying to get them to stick around. <laughs> Judy's generosity was off the charts. She gave her time and money to organizations she cared about. She was one of those folks that liked to give gifts, little hostess gifts, birthdays. Whoa, Christmas. <laughs> there are nieces and nephews' kids who just in the last weeks before my mom's death received some graduation bucks from that great auntie over in Michigan. And if you sent her a gift, no matter the size, or had her over, you received a thank you. 
Not an email, but a pretty card with some thoughtful handwritten words inside. It would cheer up your day. No matter the type of holiday, my kids received something. She'd send candy at Valentine's and these strange Halloween things that she'd find at the Sagatuck drugstore or dollar store. It was always exciting to see what Grammy had boxed up and sent us. Who will forget her warm smile, her cheerful greetings? Even in the decline of her last days, we saw that person warmly greeting hospice nurses, genuinely greeting and pleased to see her friends who were coming to see her for a last time. When I first arrived, finding her in the hospital bed, she beamed. No tears, no complaints, just happy to see me, welcoming me. <laughs> I brought Kathleen up on FaceTime on the phone, brought it up to her so she could see it. And the first thing Judy says is, hey Kat, you look good. That was so her. Anyone who has seen the dying process up close knows it's not pretty. Modesty takes a back seat. There are basic necessities to attend to. Judy was a good patient. Lots of I love yous were given to Sarah and I. And this was the final gift she gave to us. In letting go of her dignity, <laughs> becoming helpless, <laughs> she allowed us to care for her, finding in ourselves new strength and new, and new depths of love. By and large, she rested peacefully. As her body declined and the pain increased, her spirit expanded, staying true to her best traits. She was pleasant. She was patient. She was thankful. When she wanted something, she asked politely. This from a woman who was in bed, you know, dying. One night, after mostly being out of it for a couple of days, she roused herself up, saying, I'd like to watch the PBS NewsHour. We were stunned. <laughs> and they got her set up with a laptop to take in a final reporting of the affairs of this world. From the start of her cancer diagnosis, then treatments, to eventually becoming bedridden, she faced it all like she led her whole life, with composure and mental calmness and a smile for those around her. She loved Sarah and I unconditionally. I say that with all my heart. She was unwavering in her support of us all of our lives. Earlier in my life, when I called to tell her I was getting a divorce, she knew just what to say to make me comfortable. I don't think she fully understood, but she was classy that way, not to put herself in the way. Then a couple years later, she embraced Kathleen like a family member, right from day one. <laughs> they had design, fashion, and cooking in common. It was a quick friendship. She took me aside. This feels right, John. Her parenting went on like that all of her life. People have always said to Sarah and I, matter of factly, oh, I love your mom. I've been, I've been reflecting on that, the qualities that lead to that sort of admiration. She was kind, fair, a listener, engaged. She wasn't trying to change people. My Aunt Christine told me the other day that she was the best sister she could have ever had. With Judy, it wasn't her first. Others' opinions, comfort, and development mattered. People warmed to that immediately, and so we all adored her. Perhaps Judy's best quality was being a true and loyal friend. She kept hosting the annual design shop staff party long after there was a design shop. And some of you may not even know the design shop, <laughs> she's kept having these parties. <laughs> she's been a steadfast contributor to a round robin letter with DG sorority sisters going on 60 years. It's a style of friendship a bit different than today. It's a quality her generation forged out of a Great Depression and a World War. There are times when you really need one another. May we honor her by emulating that now in our time of trial. I'll close by emphasizing that Judy gave of herself in big ways as a board member on numerous organizations, Girl Scout leader in the, in the early days, and in little ways contributing to the food shelf that's out in this church's parking lot. 
and keeping little toiletries that she would collect from her travels, from hotels. And she contributed to this group that would uh, give them out to women in need. She always said her life was enriched by her giving. How lucky we all were to have her. Let's go back now into our lives. And in thinking about how she gave and thinking about her, endeavor ourselves to give more. God rest her. Come on up, Sarah. Now Sarah is going to read the letter <coughs> from Dan Miller, uh, Judy's friend and former pastor. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming, my family and my friends. I wanted to thank the church and the community for everything, making this easy for John and I. Um, and for all of this community, it's such a special community. Everybody loved my mom, so when she passed, I knew I wasn't the only one suffering. The whole community it was. And has been so beautiful. Okay, this is from Dan Miller, who um, was the pastor for 35 years, so they've known each other forever. And he's been part of our family, serving when my father passed and when my grandma passed. Um, and he couldn't be here. So here's what he wrote. It's a beautiful letter. Judy and Bill Oberholzer were the kind of people that pastors dream of having as parishioners. The first time I met with them, as they were setting, settling into our community, my prayer became, please, Lord, don't let them become Methodists or Presbyterians. We need them more than they do. And that was before I was fully to fully appreciate what a dynamic duo they were, balanced, appropriate, humble, pleasant, and filled with the Spirit of God. Over time, Judy answered God's call to graciously exercise her leadership skills wherever her gifts matched our needs. Her faith also inspired her to give tirelessly energy to a host of needs in the community at large. But I would like to highlight two areas of leadership she gave to us here at the community church. One was her leadership of our decorating team, not too much of a stretch to figure out that one. She led our group to take on color schemes, redecorating, floral arrangements, picture placements, and other related tasks with skill and unity at our old church building in residential Douglas. Then later, when we went through relocation into building extensions, she and her team made scores of decisions that did credit to our vision for a beautiful, functional house of ministry. The second volunteer area of ministry that had a great impact on all of us was her leadership on our board of trustees for two years, followed by a third year as president. In that role, she always had the big picture, long-term view in mind, and she also demonstrated the people skills that brought us to wholesome consensus. She was respected and loved by our entire congregation. Also, as ex-president, she served as a member of our pastor's advisory team for many years. This group gave themselves to the prayerful brainstorming that contributed to our staffing needs. She was a natural in helping us decide who to hire, how to shape their job descriptions, and perhaps most difficult of all, how to guide their performances. She had both the wisdom and the courage to contribute to these complicated and delicate decisions. Most of all, Lois and I also count it a great blessing to have known Judy and Bill as friends 
They brought joy and inspiration to our lives for 35 years. It was through the nurture of this gift, her friendship, that we learned how lovingly devoted and attentive Judy was as a wife, mother, and grandmother. It should be said of Judy that I was, that it was not only what she did that counts, but it was how she did it with grace, godly strength, humor, patience, generosity, and wisdom, to name just a few. Thank you, Judy, with my deep love and esteem, Dan Miller. Thank you both for sharing. Now there's a special song that Sarah and Judy began to share, especially about the time that Bill passed, and uh, Peggy and Jean are going to share it with us. upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me where trouble melts like lemon drops away from the chimney over the th where you'll find me somewhere over the rainbow bluebirds fly fly over the rainbow why then oh why can't I if happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow why oh why can't I Now we come, as we end our memorial, to the time of commendation. We don't use that word very often anymore, commendation, but it means to entrust. And so now we come uh, together to close, entrusting our memories, our shared experiences, our hope, our grief, and our joy. We entrust them and Judy into God's care. Jesus himself gave us this sure and abiding hope, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Judy, having received the promises of baptism, trusted the powerful love of God for her and for others during her entire life. And now that same love has raised her to new life in Christ. And so now in hope, we entrust her body and her soul into God's gracious, loving care. Let us pray. 
Into your hands, O oh loving Savior, we commend your daughter and your servant, Judith Ann. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints, even with her husband in light. Amen. Just before I give the final blessing, it's raining now. And so, uh, given the, um, the weather, the family would still like to invite you to um, receive some food. There's a uh, great uh, spread out there, but it's all in to-go bag, bags now. So if it's a little too cold or uh, a little too inclement for you, you can grab one of those bags and take it home and celebrate Judy, just as John said, maybe make a little special place at your table or your counter where you can remember her. But for those of you who are hardy, uh, there'll still be uh, food there and wine. Of course, you can't take the wine with you. The wine uh, has to stay here, uh, and there's some tables there. Um, I'll dismiss you uh, by asking those that are going straight home that aren't going to stay, if you'll exit first, uh, that way we won't get a bottleneck of everyone, and then those that plan to stay uh, will dismiss you. Would you stand with me if you're able to receive this blessing? Now may the God of peace who raised to new life, Jesus, our loving shepherd, guard your hearts and your minds with the sure hope of resurrection life in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. So those of you who uh, are going to leave uh, and not stay for the reception, please go ahead and exit. And for those of you that are staying, why don't you just be seated and wait until the coast is clear? <laughs>